Five means of attainment and the upai, goal worthy of attainment. There are so many distractions for us to get involved in topics of this world. So many different isms, you know, so many, especially now in Kali Yuga, especially with these cell phones, we can get distracted into a thousand different topics which are temporary, separate from the transcendental divine spiritual world. So all of these topics we should know, even if you go in there and look at them, you should know while, while you're looking at it, this is only temporary. This has no real value. Jiva kabo jade nae, hari kam tu nae, hari sa jiva chintya peda peda mai. The jiva is not a product of dull matter, nor is he cable advaitavad, absolutely one in all ways with Sri Hari. The jiva is inconceivably different and non different from Hari. He's Tatashta, he's the marginal potency. So he's one and he's different. And this is the philosophy that Sachinandan Gaurahari brought to this world, making clarification in the Guru Parampara. Prior to Mahaprabhu, there was the conception, it's called um, Parinambad. Hmm. It's, it's called like Krishna Parinam. Krishna was, or Vastu Parinambad. Krishna himself is um, transforming into this material world. It's his energy. But actually Mahaprabhu brought the conception of Shakti Parinambad that it's Shakti that's doing everything. It's the energy of Krishna, not Krishna. So this is a huge um, gift Mahaprabhu gave to the um, Sampradaya. So this is also described. Deha kava jiva nai, dara bhogya nai, dasa bhogya jiva krishna prabhu bhaktan hai. The material body should never be considered to be the jiva. And this earth is not for the jiva to exploit and enjoy. The jiva is very hard lesson. We hear it again and again. But actually at every second I'm looking, where can I get some pleasure from in this material world? If I'm not getting pleasure by my spiritual practice, the nature of my very soul is to enjoy. So I have to look for pleasure somewhere else. And that's in the material world. And the material world is full of support for that. If you want to find pleasure here, just click a button and there's a trillion different ways that they are going to offer you hmm. to try, because they're all trying to do it. How many people understand the nature of devotion or, or desire that, knowing that that is the heart of everything? There might be religious people and they're just bowing down, bowing down, asking for things. Help me, help me, help me, help me. Save me from my suffering, save me from my suffering. Then there are those who are like jnanis, wanting liberation from this material world. But if they're not connecting with devotion, that current of devotion, what is its value? Where, where is it going to be in the, in the eternal realm? It'll be just, we'll just be cheated again. Jaiva dharma nahi ache deha dharma tata nahi ache jiva gyan maya vada prata this book entitled Jaiva Dharma neither discusses matters related to the dead material body nor does it propound the Mayavadi doctrine Mayavada doctrine of the jivas oneness with Brahm. Yes, so that's the alternative. <coughs> when the jiva becomes exhausted seeking uh, liberation like this, then he wants to take the position of Krishna. <coughs> we see actually they've even got methods today where they can control the weather to a great degree. They have one group in America, it's called HUD, and they um, scatter like tiny little aluminium particles below the clouds to make the clouds come or to make the clouds not come. They can actually manipulate to some degree, which means that their intention is to take over Indra's position hmm. or God's position. That's the ultimate intention. They, they do it under the guise of science. Yes, like that thing I gave you. Mm. We think, oh yes, we can actually crack it. We can figure it all out. 
that they've left out the vital ingredient. Where is all the essential power coming from? It's coming from Sri Hari. This is where everything's Even cloud coming. seeding. Huh? Cloud seeding to get artificial rain. Yes. Yeah. Yes, all of that's there. Okay, so we're back into chapter 8. Om Maganati Mirandasya Gyananjala Shalakaya Chakshu Unmilitam Jena Tasmaya Shri Guru Venamaha Guru Ve Gauda Chandraya Radikaya Tadalaya Krishnaya Krishna Bhaktaya Tarabhaktaya Namo Namaha I'm first of all offering millions and millions of Dandrap Pranams unto the Lotus Feet of Our Most Beloved Gurudev Nitili La Pravishta Omasta Uttarazara Shishi Machila Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Goswami Maharaj. And the same again millions and millions of times unto the Lotus Feet of Our Most Beloved Nitili La Pravishta Omasta Uttarazara Shishi Machila Srila Bhakti Vedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada and all the Vaishnava, Vaishnavi devotees of the Lord, my Dandava pranams. So now we're coming back to this chapter 8 and this is a description of the Adhikas or of the stages Kanishta, Madhyam and Uttam of the devotees. So how to relate with each other. This is the objective. How will I relate with the Vaishnavas? Who am I as a Vaishnava? This will be brought up today. And what is my relationship with other Vaishnavas? So there's three distinct qualities. And amongst those three, each one is broken down into three separate ones also. So we have all that consideration. So I think I should start from the beginning of page 170. Yes. I read that just a little bit, but I'll read it again. So this is uh, the conversation with um, Haridas is being Premdas Har Haridas. That's his name. And Nityananda is asking this question. And they're sitting underneath Haridas Babaji Mahashai. And they're sitting underneath the Nitai Vat tree in Goldrundweev, right here. So on page 170. In three successive years, the bhaktas of Kulinyagram asked Sriman Mahaprabhu, what is a Vaishnava and what are the symptoms by which he can be recognized? Sri Mahaprabhu replied by instructing them about Uttam, Madhyam and Kanishta Vaishnavas. Now, according to the characteristics of his descriptions of three of these classes, as he described them, meet the standards that I have defined for Madhyam and Uttam, Vaishnavas. None of them correspond to the Kanishta Bhakta, who is only capable of worshipping the deity form because they do not utter Shuddha Krishna Nam. So unless we're uttering Shuddha pure Krishna Nam, we are actually practically not even on the Madhyam level. This means I'm chanting with attention, and I'm chanting with sufficient time during the day. I'm not just chanting, you know, 16 rounds. This is what, you know, um, some groups think. Oh, this, is, this was never enough. Prabhupada, when he first went to the West, he wanted to introduce 64 rounds. This is what he, his intention was, and then he realized that they couldn't. So then he said, all right, 32 rounds. Then he realized they couldn't even do that. He said, all right, minimum 16, minimum. What does that mean? 16 rounds, you're not really going to be progressing in your consciousness very much. It'll be like when you're treading water. When you're in the water, you know what that means? You're not actually moving, you're just staying afloat. You're perhaps staying free from Maya, but you're not really making very much progress spiritually. Because to go deep, we need to actually chant more. 32 rounds is kind of respectable, and with 32 rounds a day, the devotee starts to consider himself a devotee. He starts to have the abhiman, yes, I actually am a devotee, I'm chanting 32 rounds. That takes, what, two, three hours, four hours, say, four hours. Actually, what happens is the first 16 takes the longest, the second 16 is quicker, and the third 16 is even quicker, and the fourth 16 takes about an hour. Just that's how it goes. 
it it builds up the this, and you're still chanting pure you're still chanting good so we have to consider this being in the holy dharm and if you can connect with hari nam in the holy dharm there's so much fortune inestimable fortune we have a long way to go okay so you might be free from the court of yamaraj maybe you don't have to go to hell but that's the negative aspect but you want to go to goloka vrindavan so if you want to go to Loka, goloka vrindavan there's a lot of purification that must take place and we have the opportunity now if we're smart and we think what is the most important thing first i must heal myself before I try to heal other people. Mm -hmm. If someone is drowning in a river and you can't swim, how can you save them? You can't save them. If you run out there to save them, he'll drown you as well. So first we have to learn to swim. And if you're trying to encourage someone in the principal process, which is to chant more than 16, at least chant 17. Don't get stuck in that crazy, that, that you know, time, that, that frame, that, that only 16. And then you hang your beads up and you think, now I finish with my mala today. Actually, even if you're chanting one lakh or two lakhs, you've never finished your mala. There's always should be some more. Because every time we chant, we're going to get more inspiration come. Especially here. Because it's connecting directly to the source. The source contains sound vibration. It's sound. Originally coming from the sound of Krishna's flute. It's called Shabda Brahman. We want to connect with that sound. It's that sound that's going to purify my contaminated consciousness and bring me the inspiration to try to render service to Krishna. If I'm trying to render service to Krishna, I'm going to feel completely satisfied. Service to Krishna, of course, under guidance of Guru. If it's not under guidance of Guru, then it's just under the guidance of my mind. That's not good enough. Because I've said before, Guru represents the entire Guru Parampara. When I say Guru, I mean Bhakti Vinotako. I mean Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. I mean Bhakti Pragyan Keshav. All these personalities are embodied within the form of Guru. So if I'm serving Guru, if I'm, this is how I know if my devotion is going well. If I know that I'm pleasing my Guru, that means I'm pleasing Krishna. Because there are so many different things we can do. So that we can dig in the vegetable garden, we can go out on the street, we can do so many different activities, but which is the best activity to actually purify you at this particular point in time? And it's different for different people. It's not all the same. It's not that everyone should go out and distribute books. Not everyone should do this or everyone should do that. We each have our own capacities, our own adhikar. Some will be cooks, some will be pujaris, etc. Some will be writing, some will be printing. Some will be working with the uh, computers, etc. We all have our, some are working like this with technology. This is very good. This is wonderful service. So we have to figure out what pleases Guru. And chanting the holy name has to always be in the background or the foreground, we can say. Because that has to be uh, in place to begin with. If that chanting hasn't taken place at the beginning of the day in the early morning hours, it's only really the early morning hours that this will work because that's when the atmosphere is clean, the Brahma Muhurta hour. It's the only time in the day of the mode of goodness. After the Brahma Muhurta hour, then comes the mode of passion. All industry begins, everyone's working, running to work, etc. That's Rajagun. And then after Rajagun, then comes Tamagun in the afternoon and then evening time is Rajagun again and then night time is Tamagun again the only time is Brahma Mahurta hour so that's the time to capitalize and what's happening in the Brahma Mahurta hour the most ecstatic Leela to meditate on this Nishanta Leela Radha and Krishna are in their tightest embrace in the whole 24 hours 
at that time in the Brahma Mohurta, in the Nishanta Leela. And then they've got to separate. Vrinda Devi, she's telling all the birds to start singing, making beautiful sound. Radharani, she curses them. Oh, go to hell. I want to stay here with Krishna. Then the sound stops. And she thinks, oh, did they go to hell? <laughs> but then she doesn't care. She just wants to be with Krishna. But then somehow or other they have to separate. And then Krishna has to go back alone. Radharani, she's taken back by all her sakis, practically carried back to Javad. Krishna, he has no one with him. He falls from one tree to the next tree to the next tree, finally gets back to Nandagam, falls in his bed. As soon as he falls in his bed, Mother Yashoda comes in to wake him up. So all these pastimes are going through the mind of the Sadagat, the Brahmahurta hour, at this time of the day. It's the most beautiful time to chant. And during this time, we have enough time to chant comfortably at least 32 rounds. If you get up early enough, you get up at 3 o'clock, something like that. Why not? I mean, it's not that there's any other um, activity going on after 8.30 at night. There's nothing else going on except your mind spinning around. So you want to put that rest, and then if you take rest then, then you can easily get up then. Because we shouldn't deprive ourselves of the sleep that's needed. Don't become crazy. You take sufficient food, sufficient sleep, etc., etc., balanced. These are all aspects of Vaishnavism. All aspects of how to proceed that I'm saying here. Um, now, according to the characteristics of his description, all three of the, those classes, as he described them, meet the standards that I have defined for Madhyam and Uttam Vaishnavas. None of them correspond to the Kanishta Bhaktas, who are only capable of worshipping the deity form, because they do not utter Shuddha Krishna Nam. Their chanting is known as Chaya Nam Bas. Chaya Nam Bas refers to a semblance of the pure name, obscured by ignorance and anartas, like the sun covered by clouds, which does not manifest its full brilliance. So how to cure that chaya namabhas? Chant more. Chant more attentively. Chant more carefully. Mahavaru instructed Madhyam Adhikari Grihastha Vaishnavas to serve the three kinds of Vaishnavas, which he describes as follows. One from whose mouth Krishna Nam is heard even once. One from whose mouth Krishna Nam is heard constantly. And one whose very sight spontaneously evokes the chanting of Sri Krishna Nam. All these three types of Vaishnavas are worthy of service. But this is not true of one who only utters Nama Bas and not Shuddha Krishna Nam. Only Vaishnavas who utter Shuddha Nam are worthy of service. So look for that Vaishnava who is chanting Shuddha Nam. They are very rare. They're not just everywhere. We are instructed to serve the Vaishnavas in accordance with their respective levels of advancement. The word Maitri signifies association, conversation and service. As soon as one sees a pure Vaishnava, one should receive him respectfully, converse with him and fulfill his needs as far as one is able always looking for that service to the Vaishnava. The Vaishnava is representing Krishna completely. And if I acknowledge, if I realize, yes, this is a, a pure soul, then I should be ready to serve him in so many different ways and not become envious of him. One should serve him in all ways and one should never envy him. One should not criticize him, even by accident or disrespect him, even if his appearance is unattractive or if he has some disease it's our tendency sometimes that materially conditioned souls if we see someone that we know is more advanced than us or better than us we sometimes tend to become envious of them oh i want to be as good as you i want to be like that and then we try and then that envy we lose the opportunity to associate with that person because actually we're hurting that person. We've become envious of that person. So guarding it. 
These are wonderful guidelines that Bhakti Vinod Thakur is unpacking here. This is all coming from the Bhagavatam, it's coming from Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, it's coming from many scriptures, and Bhakti Vinod Thakur is able to challenge, ch channel all these scriptures into his writings. The third characteristic of the Madhyam Vaishnava is that he bestows mercy on the ignorant. The word Balisha refers to people who are ignorant of spiritual truth, bewildered or foolish. It means materialistic people who have not received any genuine guidance in spiritual matters, but have not been contaminated by unauthorized doctrines such as Mayabad. So this is the most common, the general people. But we all have had experience of trying to preach sometimes to those people, and they're just like brick walls are in front of them, because it takes time to, to practice this philosophy. It doesn't just happen overnight. So many times they've got huge obstructions of mental, bodily, different um, obstacles that check them. But nevertheless, the Vaishnava, he doesn't... Look at Narada Muni, when he was walking in the forest and he saw all those animals that had been pierced by that hunter, Magrari hunter. And he, he, he wasn't even killing them. He was only half killing those animals. What sort of mentality must that person have had, that Magrari hunter? And still Narada Muni went to him and spoke to him and asked him why wasn't he killing the animals straight away? Why was he only half killing them, leaving them in pain? And he said, because my father taught me how to do this, because I have learned to like the sound of the animal's pain. Imagine that consciousness, how low that consciousness must be. And Narada Muni, he stayed with that person. And then eventually that person understood all oh, this, because what, what did Narada do, Mar Muni do after that? He went and he brought all those animals back to life again. He took the arrows out of those animals and they all ran away. And then the hunter was just amazed and he saw the potency of Narada Muni and he immediately surrendered to him. And then, Narada Muni, and then he said to Narada Muni, how can I surrender to you? And Narada Muni said, first break your bow. <laughs> That's his livelihood. So first break your bow and then I will instruct you. So he broke his bow. Then he said, you build a little house here and don't worry for food, for any eating, I will send everybody. And then so many people were coming and offering him fruits. He didn't have to do anything. Then he, he was getting too many fruits. And then when Narada Muni went back with Parvat Muni to visit him a year later, that same hunter, he was coming to meet him, running very, then he saw ants on the road in front of him. And he very carefully with his Chada moved the ants to go for. So this is how purified he came. But what I'm stressing is the amount of patience and time Narada Muni had with this hunter. And we also sometimes must have great patience with the people that we're trying to encourage to chant Hare Krishna. It's not just going to happen like that. We can remember, you know, some of them are so thick, especially in India, just Bollywood and mm -hmm. marriage, you know, that's, that's all that's cooking in their head. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, uh, the word Bali. Baleshu refers to people who are ignorant of spiritual truth, bewildered or foolish. It means materialistic people who have not received any genuine guidance in spiritual matters, but have not been contaminated by unauthorized doctrines, such as if someone's been contaminated by Mayabad philosophy, then just give them up, just say Hare Krishna and see you later. You, you can't cut that one. That, that's, that's, that's very difficult to cut. They are not envious of bhaktas and bhakti, but their mundane egoism and attachment prevents them from developing faith in Ishwar. This is very interesting. Bhakti Nathakur is stressing their mundane egoism, this sense of how great I am, and their various attachments that they've got in this life. These are the two things, their misidentification and their attachment, especially rich, wealthy people. How can you preach to a wealthy person 
I've told you that story before. My Gurude was on a lift in New York, and one woman got in full of gold jewelry, gold earrings, you know, obviously very, very wealthy. And my Gurude said, um, Have you got God in your life? And the woman said, Why do I need him? <laughs> I have so much, you know. So a rich person is thinking like that. They don't need God. They don't have any brain for God. Learned scholars also belong to this category if they have not attained the highest fruit of study, which is to develop faith in Ishwara. Even if you're very, very smart and you study all the scriptures, but you haven't developed that natural effect. You haven't become aware of Krishna in the atmosphere everywhere. You haven't become aware of Krishna in the heart of all living entities. You haven't become aware of what is Krishna's seva. You haven't picked up that mood yet. Because it's the seva that is going to endear, that means attract Krishna to you. If you're doing Krishna seva directly, Krishna is going to be attracted to you. And then that Krishna prem will flow in the heart. The Kanishta Adhikari Prakrita Bhakta is standing at the doorway to the temple of Bhakti. But because of ignorance in the principles of Sambandha Gyan, he has not yet attained Shuddha Bhakti. Such a person is also regarded as Balisha until he comes to the platform of Shuddha Bhakti. When he becomes acquainted with the truth of Sambandha Gyan and awakens taste for Shuddha Harinam, in the association of pure bhaktas, his ignorance will be dissipated and he will attain the status of a Madhyam Vaishnava. So this is the path. Very clear, very simple. We have to associate with devotees that we are considering are more advanced than us. And they should be favorable to us and affectionate to us and of the same mood. Swajatiya Shnita Ashraya. It is essential that a Madhyam Vaishnava should bestow his mercy upon all the above mentioned ignorant people. He should treat them as guests and should satisfy their needs as far as he is able. That means charitable, that means a big heart, always looking to please. We should always, in life, looking to please, how, how to please, how to relieve someone of their suffering. Always trying to please someone like that, in a suffering condition. Um, he should also act in such a way as to awaken their faith in Ananya Bhakti. This is the main thing, not just be generous hearted, but actually to awaken their faith. If we're a bhakta and we're looking like a devotee, then by doing kind deeds, that person's going to think, oh, all devotees are like this, or this is the nature of a devotee, that he's always kind. But just being kind in itself is not sufficient. We want to try and infuse that consciousness with what is bhakti, what is devotion. Otherwise, they're missing. He should, uh, he should also act in such a way as to awaken their faith in Ananya Bhakti and their taste for Shuddhanam. That is the real meaning of mercy. The ignorant may be victimized by bad association and may fall down at any time because they lack expertise in the Shastra. The Madhyam Vaishnava should always protect such susceptible people from bad association. He should mercifully give them his association and gradually instruct them in spiritual matters and in the glories of Shuddhanam. Shuddhanam also means to study the Shastra. Srila Gurudev just had a little clip on the uh, circular about chanting Harinam is not sufficient by itself. We actually have to, it's our duty to know the scripture so that if someone is asking some type of question, even if we can't answer, we know where to look for the answer. We know which scripture to look in to give the answer. We should be very familiar. That's our seva. Our seva is to study the Shastra, to chant Hare Krishna and to study the chapter, uh, 
study the Shastra. This, um, because... Ananya Bhakti means Shuddha Bhakti. Ananya Bhakti means Shuddha Bhakti. Shuddha Bhakti, pure Bhakti. Ananya, yes, yes, yes. Kevala Bhakti, he has different names. You okay, Ma? Tigache? Um, he should mercifully give them his association and gradually instruct them in spiritual matters and in the glories of Shuddha Nam. This is our seva. A diseased person must be under the care of a physician because he cannot cure himself. Just as one should pardon the anger of a diseased person, so one should also excuse the improper behavior of the ignorant. Just like my Gurudev, he would sit, you know, amongst so many fallen Western devotees and they wouldn't know how to behave or anything and he was so patient with them so many times and just tolerating, tolerating, tolerating. This is the quality of a Shuddha Vaishnava, of a pure Vaishnava, an Uta. He will tolerate fully any condition and we also must try to do that. This attitude is known as mercy. The ignorant have many misconceptions such as faith in Karmakand, occasional inclination towards Gyan, worshipping the deity with ulterior motive, faith in yoga, indifference towards the association of pure Vaishnavas, attachment to Varnashram, and many other things. This is just a, these are things that the devotees get caught up in. Attachment to Varnashram, faith in yoga, indifference to the association of pure devotees, worshipping the deity, and having ulterior motives, that means I'm asking for something, something for me. These are all deep um, things to consider. When we're reading this Jaiva Dharma, we should be thinking, yes, he's talking about me. How can I purify these various obstacles that are in my life so that I can go more quickly in the right direction? This is Shastra is... Um, written by the sages and rishis to support the devotee. It's not written to intimidate or something of that nature. It's, it's going to give us support, you know. And if we take this Shastra deeply, regularly, we will make progress. However, the Kanishta Arikari can quickly become a Madhyam Arikari when these misconceptions are dispelled by good association mercy and good instructions. How will you get that without association or good instructions and mercy? You won't. You'll just be bewildered. There's many people in the world today that are spread out, just living in their houses, you know, separate from devotees. They have a devotee sentiment. They want to be devotees, but because they don't have any company, this is why we do these live streaming. So perhaps it's, it's so accessible now. You just go on to the Facebook and then there you have. And this is, this is a good second best. If you don't have the um, opportunity to actually sit here, then taking it on the Facebook, what's the problem with that? You're still getting it. If you have any questions, you can just type them out and the questions will certainly be addressed. So it's the best thing we can do. We do, the Vaishnav does the needful, whatever he can do in the circumstances. Like if you decide to go back, you're from, where are you from, Russia or Ukraine? Russia. Russia. So if you have to go back to Russia, you can still be in touch. It's not like you ever have to leave this Jaiva Dharma. Wherever you go, you can be in touch. Um, when such people begin to worship the deity of Bhagavan, it may be understood that they have laid the foundation of all auspiciousness. Of this, there is no doubt. So if someone is worshipping Takuji, there's no doubt that he's on the right track. They do not have they do not have the defect of adhering to false doctrines, and for this reason they have a scent or a smell of true Shraddha. And how did the Shraddha come? Through instruction, through the ear. Shravanam, they heard with faith. 
Their deity worship is not like that of the Mayavadis, who do not have even a trace of Shraddha for the deity, and who are offenders at the lotus feet of Bhagavan. The Mayavad worships um, the deity because he wants something. It's like we have the example of Ekalabhya. Mm. He worshipped Dronacharya. He wanted something. He wanted to defeat Arjun and Karna in archery. He, that was his motivation for doing that. It wasn't to come to God. So Dronacharya, he punished him, asked for his thumb as Dakshin, and he gave it immediately. So his Actually in India, Ekalabhya is celebrated yeah. in the wrong way. They don't know. They don't know the actual... No. So many things they don't know. This is why you have to go into the world at some point and tell the people this. You can't just be Babaji in retreat mm -hmm. and not go out and... How will you get mercy if you're not going to give mercy? If you're not going to give mercy, how can you expect mercy? So somehow or other you have to be considering how will you give mercy to your family members and then beyond your family members also. This is the process. The, that is why the word Shraddhaya Ihate, he worships with faith, have been used in the Shloka 11247 that describes the Kanishta Bhakta. The philosophical outlook lodged in the heart of Mayavadis and proponents of other similar doctrines is that Bhagavan has no form, that the deity which is worshipped is simply an imaginary icon. Under such circumstances, how can there be any faith in the deity? As a result, there is a significant difference between deity worship of Mayavadis and that of even the most neophyte Vaishnavas. So even if it's a big Mayavad, has so many followers, if he's not seeing Krishna in the deity form as being the direct personality of Godhead, if he's seeing him as just a stepping stone to his glory, his center stage, then what kind of apparatus is he forming? Kanista Adhikari Vaishnavas worship the deity with faith, knowing that Bhagavan possesses personal form and attributes. And for the devotee, when we start to hear about Krishna's moods and attitudes and qualities, what does Krishna have? He has um, four special qualities. What are they? Lila. Prem Madhuri. Leela Madhuri, Rup Madhuri, and Venu Madhuri. These four exceptional qualities that Lord Narayan doesn't have. And if we start to unpack these four, they're just incredibly sweet and beautiful. This Prem Madhuri. What sort of Prem does Krishna have for his, his, his um, bhaktas? And in Vrindavan, the followers. <clears throat> so beautiful the relationships that are described all um, controlling Krishna by their love because of their affection Krishna is a chute, he's unconquerable and yet he can be conquered by his loving devotee he, he allows himself to be conquered this is how beautiful is Krishna like when he's playing with the Sakas and then sometimes he has to carry Sridham on his back because he lost so many things. And he's fighting even with Sri Dham. And Sri Dham defeats him. But Krishna says, no, my nose is going up. And your nose is looking down, so I've defeated you. Mm. Krishna is a cheater all the way. The Mayavadis, they just don't even come in contact with these types of um, uh, thoughts of the beauty and sweetness of Krishna. You can hear... Bhaktivinoda you know, Thakur's mood of aggression towards the Mayavads, because they hurt Krishna, actually. Kanishta Adhikari Vaishnavas worship the deity with faith, knowing that Bhagavan possesses personal form and attributes. Mayavadis, however, believe that Bhagavan has no form or attributes, and that the deity is therefore imaginary and temporary. Neophytes are not guilty of the offense of Mayavad, and that is why they are accepted as Prakrita Vaishnavas, materialistic devotees even though they do not possess any other Vaishnava characteristics. This is where their Vaishnavism is found, on the strength of this one quality, and by the mercy of sadhus they will certainly gradually be elevated. 
It's a process. It's a process. We're in process. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada used to say, we're in the shower. We're already in the shower. We're taking bath. We're there. It's just a matter of time until my deepest desire starts to focus on Krishna. And I, I, I become hungry to please Him, hungry to satisfy Him, hungry to know about Him in Vrindavan. And how do I know about Him? Through the Braja Devis, through the Gopis. This is how I really know about Krishna, because this is what's really in Krishna's heart, is being with them through Sri Radhika. And that's why Mahaprabhu is so merciful, because he's actually exhibiting that mood of Sri Radha Rani. His golden complexion just melts everybody. Gopi Bhattu. Gopi Bhattu, yes. Sadhatam. Vaishnavas must be... Madhyam Adhikari Vaishnavas must be generally mer genuinely merciful towards such people. And if they are, the neophyte Bhaktas' worship of the deity and his chanting of Harinam will quickly rise from the Abbas stage to the purely transcendental stage. Number four. This is all describing Madhyam. The Madhyam Vaishnavas' fourth characteristic is neglect towards those who are inimical. Here we must define enmity and describe its different types. You know what enmity means, Lily's prayer? Mm -mm. Also no. Inimical mm -hmm. means angry towards, not... not Envious towards. Mm. How you say it, Chuta? Mm. Ukraine and Russian are quite similar languages, mm. huh? But not similar people. Similar <laughs> people, little bit. Huh? It's like brothers, but we we from Belarus. We know. Oh, from Belarus. Okay. Same city. What Sundarga Paul is Ah. Okay. 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 I know other devotees from Belarus also. Nice. Um, here we must define enmity, that means hatred, Lalita Priya, mm. and describe its different types. Dvesh. Enmity is a particular attitude which is also known as matsarata, envy. Okay? Envy. And which is exactly the opposite of love. That's how you can understand it. I think people be envy and after that they change to love, you know. Devotees. Yes, the, the devotee feels envy and then by association he starts to feel love. So so this um, dvesh, this is describing how the madhyam has to deal with those people who are angry with the Vaishnavas, who don't like the Vaishnavas, who are envious of the Vaishnavas, how will he deal with them? And which is exactly the opposite of love. So he, they are being angry with him. How is he going to deal with them? Ishwara is the only object of love, and Dvesh is the attitude that is directly opposite to love for him. So these are like the Mayavadis. You just ignore them. There are five different types of dvesh. Absence of faith in Ishwara. The belief that Ishwara is nothing more than a natural potency that brings about the results of all actions. Like a machine just fulfilling our various karmas, etc. The belief that Ishwara has no particular form. This is like the Muslims, Islam, Allah, they don't, they don't give him a form. The belief that the Jeevas are not eternally subordinate to Ishwara. Subordinate to Ishwara. You understanding these, Lady to prayer? Dvesh means envy. So it's describing the nature of these envious people, that they don't have any faith in Krishna. They have a belief that Krishna is nothing more than a, like an order supplier. I pray to him and he will give me. 
People go to church because they want something from Krishna. Sometimes they go to the temple because they want something. They want to be saved from hell. Or they want some wealth. They have a desire. Many times people even walk around Govardhan Hill because they have so many desires. They're not necessarily walking out of affection for Krishna or even Giriraj. They're just thinking, oh, he's a big personality, he'll give me something. So they walk all the way around and completely tire themselves out, but they think, now I will get my wish, my material wish fulfilled. What a tragedy that they haven't been educated sufficiently to know that they can get the highest wealth. It's like a beggar for a king. He's, he's just asking for a penny, when actually he could ask for so much. The belief that Ishvara has no particular form, Lalita Priya, has no form. You understand that, right? Um, the belief that the Jeevas are not eternally subordinate to Ishvara, they're not his servants, that actually I am as good as Krishna. The absence of mercy, this is what those people with that mood of dvesh, we're just going through the four um, qualities of a madhyam mm -hmm. that was described before. Is Ishvara Tad Abhineshu Baleshu Vishatu Cha. So this Dvesh is being described. How about uh, mm, so between the God brothers, like when you are in a, a mm. devotee society, uh, there are chances of misunderstanding, Matsarya Dvesh. So how do we overcome that? Very difficult. <laughs> what to say? We have to, we can develop these qualities. It's described sometimes, if you're living in a community of devotees, it's like lots of stones inside a bag with rough edges, and you bang the bag up and down, and then the rough edges become smooth. So by constantly having difficulties with devotees, gradually, gradually, you realize this is not the way. It's not the way to keep fighting. What is the way, right? Better to just be submissive and to hear, and to be forgiving and loving. So how to balance these things sometimes? You want the best, you don't want them to eat peanuts, but they're going to do. So how are you going to balance that? How are you how going to, to save figure them? that? How you? No, don't think like that, because that means how to fail them. Yeah, but you have. If somebody doesn't want to be helped, and you push them like that, that's called fanaticism. Mm -hmm. And that just creates friction and doesn't end up with anything positive at all. Actually, it ends up both people are like this. They're not closer together. If you demonstrate yourself in your own life, your good, powerful health by not taking peanuts on a kadashi, for example, then after some time, people will ask, Oh, Lalita Priya, how come you're always so healthy? How come you're always so bright and strong? Oh, because I don't eat peanuts on a kadashi. Okay, that's simple. You don't have to fight them for it and try and shut it, you know, push it, push it, push it. That When you push anything, there's always a back push to it. You can't push. It's not push it, just to make aware. She's doing it now. Now Your nature is this. Like when there's a, like this, not like this, I mean, no. No, like this. Yeah. yeah, so this Aparad on both sides, will that be counted as Vaishnava? If one devotee is expressing their desire very heavily and not sensitively, hmm. then that's going to create a friction and discord. Hmm. And it can create Aparad. If the person becomes really angry in the end, then it can be apparat through. It can come to that. So this is all negative. Yes. I mean, best we just do the best we can, how we're doing it. And, and don't try to um, inflict your particular person. Like somebody might get up at one o'clock in the morning and say, why doesn't everybody else get up at one o'clock in the morning? Everyone should get up at one o'clock in the morning and start banging a big, big drum at one o'clock in the morning. How is that going to go down? Is that going to be successful? Oh, in Shastra it says you should get up at one o'clock in the morning. No. Each person has to figure out their own balance. It's like a string on an instrument. Each instrument 
has its own harmony. Not too tight, because the string will break. And not too loose, because it won't play. So you individually have to find your own balance. Some will be able to get up very early. Some can't get up until late, every single day like that. It's just the nature. And we have to learn to accept. What is the meaning of trinata pisu niche na, tarora pisu ishina, amani na, mana de na. We should, uh, this is what we're doing in, in this chapter 8. We're trying to appreciate who is a kanishta, who is a madhyam, who is an uttam, so that we can develop our relationships with the Vaishnavas nicely. And there will always be discord when I'm not respectful to the Vaishnavas. If I'm not respectful to this person, and I think he has to do what I say, he has to do what I say, this is not being respectful. You can point out the point, and then you leave it for them to digest and decide themselves. You can never force this. As soon as you try to use force, there comes back force to you. Always, every single time. And that's what creates disharmony. 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 We should try and be in harmony, not disharmony. And if you see something, make sure you do it yourself. That's the principle. But you can't force other people. You can. Try. And you just keep banging your head against the stone, you know, but nothing happens. Individuals whose hearts are contaminated by these inimical attitudes are absolutely bereft of Shuddha Bhakti. Beware. They do not have even Prakrita Bhakti, the rudimentary, that means the beginning devotion, that is the doorway to Shuddha Bhakti, and which is represented by the neophyte Bhakta's worship of the deity. The five types of enmity are found to coexist with attachment to material sense enjoyment. Sometimes the third and fourth types of enmity lead to such an extreme form of asceticism or aversion towards the world that culminates in self-annihilation. Hmm. This is seen in the lives of the Mayavad sannyasis. How should Shuddha Bhaktas behave towards such inimical people? It is their duty to avoid them. That's the final instruction. If someone is of this nature, very aggressive, mayavad, full of anger towards the Vaishnavas, you ignore them. You can't do anything for them. The word nirpeksh, neglect, does not imply that one should abandon all social dealings. This is a very important part. Don't misunderstand this, because you still, we still are living in this world, so we still have to interact with each other. So, on the street when we walk, there are so many people who are complete Mayavads, but still we have to interact with them. If you want to go and buy a ticket for a train, perhaps the train man is, you know, a complete Mayavad. Perhaps you want to go to a doctor. Most doctors are like Mayavads. You still have to deal with them, you know? You have to deal with all kinds of different people in the world. So this is what this is talking about now. The word Neopeksh neglect does not imply that one should abandon all social dealings that are normal between human beings. Normal means polite behavior, respectful. Nor does it mean that one should fail to alleviate an inimical person's difficulty or deprivation if he falls into distress. That means if someone is unhappy, and maybe they're a very fallen person like a Mayavad, and they've hurt themselves, you shouldn't hesitate to go and help them. That's the nature of the Vaishnava. We know the story of the saintly man, he's walking across the river, and a scorpion just jumps on his head and, hand and bites him. And the saintly person, he doesn't kill, the, he just drops it back, in the, and again the scorpion catches him. And three times it tries to bite him. And three times he just... Then the scorpion says to the saintly person, Why aren't you killing me? I'm trying to actually kill you. Why aren't you killing... And the saintly person says, Because this is your nature. 
to inflict pain on others. My nature is not to. So I'm not going to give up my Vaishnava avatar. I'm not going to give up my good nature just because you keep harassing me to, to um, behave in a contrary way to my nature. You understand? Tell me. Uh, the scorpion's way is to in, means, uh, inflict uh, pain, pain to others, whereas the bhakta is always giving love. Yes. So why uh, he can't uh, do what the scorpion is yes. doing? Yes. Yes. He's not going to change his opinion. The scorpions also have poison with his heel. Heel. Huh? Scorpions have poison with heel. I know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's good. It's very dangerous. Mm -hmm. We should sure. kill scorpions. No problem. So and we maybe can kill my snakes. is coming to help to see love. Mm. <laughs> but the part, the point is this analogy. It's to demonstrate the good qualities should be maintained. We should always attempt to keep our good qualities. Even if someone is very angry to us, we should still try to not necessarily be angry back to them. You know? Mm, yeah. That'll probably make them more angry, though. Um, uh, here we go. Grihastha Vaishnavas remain within society so they have many types of relationships right mm. for instance with relatives through marriage and with others through business dealings through the maintenance of property and bringing up of animals through endeavoring to mitigate the suffering and ailments of others and through their position as citizens of the state these different social realizations entail connection with inimical people. Inimical means not nice people. Angry means like you can translate as like Mayava towards the devotee, inimical. Lalita Priya, you should have one of those uh, dictionaries, you know, like a, a, a telephone dictionary that you can get the words, because I don't want you to be in ignorant of these truths. I want you to get this truth. These different social relations entail connection with inimical people and avoidance does not mean that one should at once give them up. If someone is very angry with you in the family, you don't disregard them. You just become very patient and tolerant, etc. This is what he's saying. One is obliged to conduct routine affairs and interact with people who are indifferent to Ishwara but one should not take their association when it comes to spiritual matters. So you have a large family and you have one person who's very angry in the family, you don't ignore them, you don't beat them, you, you are always trying to be affectionate with them, but you never share with them your deepest spiritual mood because they will never understand. They can't understand, they're blocked like a wall, you know. They can't understand this. But we don't kick them out of the family. It's like in an institution sometimes, they, they like to send people away. My Gurudev's institution, he never sent anybody away. If somebody was so badly misbehaved, the objective would be to try to rectify their behavior, not to just chop them off and throw them away. That's not the answer for anybody. Okay, so I hope you understood all these things. Mm -hmm. Because they're very beautiful truths, very beautiful. Alita Priya should read this again yourself, by yourself. And if any questions come, and if you have a dictionary while you're reading it, if you need that, there's no problem with that, if you don't understand a word. I mean, many, the language here is very... Actually, my friend in England, he took this book to Cambridge University, and he gave it to the teachers and said, where does this sit in your curriculum? Is this a beginner's book, a middle book, or an end book? Kanishta, Madhyam, or Uttam. The teachers, they read it, you know, after a month. They came back and said, oh, this is post-PhD. Mm. Post-PhD. So the language here is not just simple language. Mm. So it's understandable if you don't know all the meanings of the words. So you should have some, you know, dictionary, something. I have a question. So, 
to Vaishnava, Vaishnava cannot be envy. This is all we, we need to avoid people who is these five qualities. Very good. Dvesha. 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 So, yes. towards Vaishnavas, we cannot avoid them. Yes, because they and that's what it's saying now. That's the last paragraph we just read. You can't avoid them in social dealings. Mm -hmm. Social dealings means your family on the street like this, but you don't share with them your spiritual mm -hmm. mood. You don't tell them not to eat peanuts, for but example. But then they will be continue to be envy towards you. How to fix it? No, no, it? you can't stop that. You can't, you can't change that. But to protect your sudden bhajan, you don't, you can't do anything for them. They're locked in something dark. That's their karma. You know, if you try, you will probably end up by committing an offense. Mm -hmm. You can't give the holy name to someone who's so offensive because then they might start to blaspheme you like that. I'm asking about Vaishnavas. I don't have someone who is not Vaishnavas. If you're meeting a Vaishnava, Vaishnavas are not like this. This no, is not I talking see, about yeah. Vaishnavas. Mm -hmm. It's talking about people, like Mayavadis. Mm -hmm. It's not talking about Vaishnavas. Mm -hmm. No, no. If someone I is a Vaishnava. I think Mataji is uh, telling, like, suppose, uh, suppose you're going to preach to Iskon people. All right. And is that what? And no. they're inimical to you. So don't go there. If they're inimical, don't bother. Or in, or in our community sometimes people. Huh? Or in our community sometimes people. So as much as possible, no need for confrontation. It's, it's not, we're not trying to force this. This bhakti, this is what we have to understand. It's a place in the heart. It's not in the head. If you're trying to convince someone in the head, it's not going to give them bhakti. They can only be convinced with love. And if someone doesn't love you from the beginning, how will you, what will you give them? You can just answer some questions if they ask, and then Hare Krishna, see you later. You can't spend much time there. There's no value. It's just wasting your energy. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada used to say on the street when we were distributing books, he said, don't try and preach to the people, just give them the book. If you spend longer than three minutes with the person, you're wasting your time. Because you could have given books to about six other people in that time. If they get the book, if you're speaking to someone over there and they're genuinely interested, then give them a book. Give them Jaivadam or something like that. That will be a benefit. But don't waste your energy. You know, my guru is better than your guru. Well, you know, doesn't do anything for anybody not for them not for you not for anything actually they just become more angry with you mm -hmm. isn't it better they just stay you know well what can you do i meet so many people like that you know they always challenging challenging you can't give this knowledge to someone who is challenging you if someone challenges you, it means they want to defeat you with their impersonal mood, with their Mayavad conception. They actually don't want the truth. They don't have the adhikar for the truth. Think about these things deeply. Srila Gurudev ki jai, Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Srila Bhakti Nautakul ki jai, Jai Vidama ki jai, Vaishnavas ki jai, Vanshaka Kutarubhyas jai, Kripa Sindhaviva jai, Patitanam Pavanimya Vaishnavaimya. Vaishnavas ki jai, gopi